as you read about the Inuit, use the information from the book to add it to your organizer. Be sure to add it to the correct section for your information. In the table of contents, you will see Chapter 1, Early Inuit History. What do we know about the Inuit's early history? Number 2, Chapter 2, Survival in the Arctic. What do the Inuit eat? How do they dress? And where do they live? Those are all key terms that we're going to need as we use your flipbook organizer. The amazing caribou. Caribou is an animal. How does the caribou survive in the cold? This information may not be relevant since you are talking about the Inuit. It may be used as interesting facts, but do not use it as a focal point. Chapter 3. Travel by land and sea. How do the Inuit get from one place to another? This is all about transportation. Chapter 4. Inuit Society. How do the roles of men and women differ? True statistics, resources, important words, which are your is your glossary, the index about the authors. Here's an interesting fact. Inuit coats called amots have pockets for carrying babies. You might want to add that they have coats called amots into your how they dress section or their clothing. Early Inuit history. As I read, think about where this information could fit in your flipbook. The Inuit have always been an Arctic people. The cold tundra and icy seas influence everything in their lives. Today, the Inuit live in eastern Siberia, across northern Alaska and Canada, and in Greenland. But 1,100 years ago, the Inuit's ancestors, the people of the Thule culture, made their home on the Alaskan coast. An individual member of the Inuit people is called an Inuk. As I look at this information, I would probably want to include that the member of the Inuit people is called an Inuk. I would also want to make sure that I know 1,100 years ago, their ancestors of the Thule culture made their home on the Alaskan coast. So you could write the coast of Alaska, which is where they lived 1,100 years ago. Today, you could use that they still exist, however, that would probably go under interesting facts. The Thule Culture People in the Thule Culture built houses with stone floors. Whalebone walls were covered with rock, animal skins, and a layer of sod, which is like a layer of soil. So if you think about what they made their house out of, their frame was whale bones. They used stone floors for the base and the walls were covered with rock, animal skins, and a layer of sod or like a thick layer of soil. They lived in small groups of fewer than 50 people. When traveling on land they used sleds made of driftwood and pulled by dogs. For sea travel, they built large boats called umayaks by tying walrus and seal skins over a driftwood frame. So if you pick apart this information right here, some of the things you might want to take note of are they built houses. Their houses were whalebone walls covered with rock, animal skins, and a layer of sod. Make sure you also include that they have stone floors and that they lived with 50 people. This should go under your shelter. Then, transportation. 
would use traveling on land. They would use sleds made of driftwood pulled by dogs. In the ocean, they built large boats called umayaks. They tied the walrus and seal skins over a driftwood frame. So driftwood is like the wood that washes up on the beach that is really weathered and it looks old. And they would put seal skin and driftwood and walrus skins over a driftwood frame. So that's your base, and then they use those skins over top of it. So you have two things to fill out. Shelter, and then down here would be your transportation. Around the year, 1000 CE, members of the Thule culture began moving east. Along the way, they encountered a people called the Tunite. The Tunite belonged to the simpler Dorset culture. They lacked dogs for drawing sleds and bows and arrows for bringing food such as caribou and polar bears. By the 1200s, the Thule peoples had better tools and weapons. This allowed them to drive away the Tunite and settle in western Greenland. This right here gives you a little bit more information about how they developed more as a culture, but it's not as important as including all of this page as well. If you look at the caption right here, it says the people of the Thole culture made the framework of houses from whale bones. That gives you an idea of what it looks like. The Inuit carved pictures on walrus tusks. Inuit sometimes carves the story of hunts or other events on treasured objects. Once in Greenland, the Thule peoples encountered travelers from across the Atlantic Ocean, the Vikings. You may have heard of the Vikings before. The Vikings called the native peoples they met Skraelings. As times the two groups may have traded, Viking writings state that at other times they fought. How often it happened is unknown. Both the Thule peoples and the Vikings hunted during the summer on Greenland's eastern coast. This is probably where they encountered one another. These are Inuit people in Greenland. You could use this to help you identify about where they hunted. They hunted during the summer on Greenland's eastern coast. So this could probably go under food if you needed more information there. In Canada, meanwhile, a shift in climate that experts call the Little Ice Age made the Arctic colder. The full peoples moved farther south. No longer could they hunt the whales they had once used for meat, homes, and umayaks. As the Thul traveled, they encountered other Native American people, such as the Ngogwin. The two groups did not get along very well. Over time and with their travels, the ways of the Thul changed. They eventually developed into a new people known as the Inuit. So at first they were called Thuls, then they were called the Inuit over time. That's probably important for your readers to note that over time they started as Thul and they changed to Inuit. Up here you will see that the Algonquin gave the Inuit the name Eskimos. Eskimos is how we refer to some of these Native Americans today, which is where you probably heard that name before. Traditionally, the Algonquin people lived in what is now Quebec and Ontario, Canada. Survival in the Arctic. Let's take a look at the caption. An Inuit hunter walks across the ice. The Arctic is both cold and very dry. It is actually a desert. To live in the Arctic's extreme cold demands toughness. To get by, human beings need high energy food, special clothing, and the right tools. 
Their homes have to protect against frigid temperatures and howling winds. The Thu peoples, and later the Inuit and other Arctic peoples, such as the Aleut and the Yupik, became experts in meeting the challenges. Arctic life, however, has never been easy. Even today, with electricity, packaged food, and snowmobiles, Arctic life is not easy for most people. So here it talks about how they actually survived back then and now. This heading is called the search for food. In this heading, I would use a lot of this information to help with your section labeled food. The tundra grow ground thaws only a few inches deep in summer and only for a short time. This means the climate, which is called the tundra, actually only gives way when you try to dig under the ground a few inches in summer and only for a short time. Otherwise, it's frozen solid. Because of the lack of good soil, as well as the Arctic's short, warm season, the Inuit were unable to grow crops, so they can't get corn and strawberries and peaches and oranges like we could. Instead, here's where you want to add your food. They survived by hunting, fishing, and gathering plant foods such as berries, roots, and seaweed. For most Inuit, meat from wild animals was the most important resource of food food. Inuits used harpoons to hunt seals and walruses. So here are the weapons they used. Here are all the foods that they used that you will use in your organizer. A seal meal. Ringed seals weigh up to 150 pounds. Fatty, protein-rich seal meat even gave people strength and energy. So I'm thinking that they eat seals as well. Seals sometimes made up half of the Inuit diet. I'm going to underline that because I think that that's really important. That seals seem like an important resource for the Inuit people. Inuit went after all kinds of seals and hunted in the same way as polar bears. Bears wait by holes that seals make in the ice in order to surface and breathe. Like the bears, an Inuit hunter lay on the ice next to an air hole with his harpoon, a spear with a sharp tip made of bone. So here are the weapons. Here is food. And here is how they hunt. Just like a polar bear, they go up to the hole, lean over, and wait until the seal needs to surface. The seal needs to surface so it can breathe because it can't stay underwater since it is a mammal. The hunter would drop a wood chip or other floater into the water. Just before the seal appeared, the floater moved. So think about this, they dropped something and with the movement of the water, it starts to move, so they know that the seal is coming. This let the hunter know the seal was coming. He timed his harpoon thrust for when the seal came up through the hole. Then he dragged the seal onto the ice. When finished, he made a sacrifice to Sedna, the water spirit. This showed respect for the seal's spirit. Not doing so brought bad luck, the Inuit believed. Inuit often ate the meat raw where they had made the kill. So here it talks a little bit about their culture and religion and how important animals and nature were to them. So if you wanted to add something to like the interesting facts section about how they make sacrifices and how they use the spirits of the animal to show respect. The Mighty Bowhead. Inuit gathered into groups to hunt large animals such as walruses, narwhals, and especially the 65-foot bowhead whale. When whaling, 20 hunters set, hunters set out in an umayak and launched a harpoon-dragging air-filled seal skin bags. The bags kept a bowhead from plunging into deep water after it was hit. 
Then whenever it surfaced for air, the hunters harpooned it again. They continued to attack the whale until it died. So what might be important here is that they actually travel in groups. They gather in groups to hunt large animals such as walruses, narwhals, and especially the bowhead whale. This would be good for food and how they hunt. That they also use their mayak, which is their boat that they built, to be able to find these creatures in the sea. Other meat. Here it states, in Europe, the caribou is called the reindeer. So you might have heard of caribou or reindeer. Caribou can swim six miles per hour. Other meat. So it sounds like we're going to learn more about food. Groups of Inuit also hunted the huge, dangerous walrus. When not hunting, men and sometimes women fished for Arctic cod and lake trout. So here's some more food we want to underline. They hunted huge, dangerous walrus. They might also fish for cod and lake trout. Those are types of fish. Groups of hunters also track the large herds of caribou over the tundra. In addition to spearing the animals, hunters tried to drive the caribou into rivers. This made the caribou easier to catch. Why do you think that is? Why would they ask, like, make them go into the rivers? Because there they have to swim. And they don't actually swim as fast as they run. So it's easier for the hunters to capture them when they are in the boats and the caribou are in the river. This over here just gives you some more information about the bowhead whale, long-lived giants. The bowhead whale may have the longest lifespan of any animal. This was proven in 2007 when a 130-year-old harpoon tip was dug out of a bowhead that had recently been killed in Alaska. The tip dated to about 1880, meaning the whale had been alive in that year. Scientists believe the bowhead was even older. Because native hunters never killed calves, the whale must have been at least a few years old when it was harpooned. That's amazing that these animals may have the longest life of any animal. I have actually never heard of the bowhead whale, so this gives me some interesting facts I may or may not want to add to my information. Clothing. Inuits traditionally dressed in furs to keep warm. This is something that you may want to add to your foldable, saying that they dressed in furs. Clothing. Animals provided the Inuit with clothes as well as food. Inuit women turned animal skins into shirts, leggings, which are pants, shoes, and boots. They used bone needles and made thread from tendon. And here this word tendon is bolded. It is a part of the animal that is part of the muscles and the tissue. For an Inuit hunter, a woman's skill with needle and thread meant the difference between life and death. Men depended on their clothes to stay warm and dry. A flaw in a boot, for example, could lead to frostbite and death. Frostbite is something that people get if it's way too cold outside and your skin becomes exposed to that cold air. So it was very important for the women to sew very carefully and have everything perfectly mended for the clothes to keep the men warm and dry. If I were adding to my organizer, I would make sure that I would use animal skins as a part of my clothing and that they used it for shirts, leggings, shoes, and boots. I would also make sure to mention that if there's a flaw, and a flaw is like a mistake in clothing, it could lead to frostbite or death. Knowing your sewing. Women found the strongest, best tendon in the back of the caribou. 
In addition, the caribou skin made excellent clothing. The animal's hollow hairs trapped air. As a result, clothing made from caribou hide was both warm and lightweight. To make clothes, the women sewed a double line of tiny stitches together tightly. Water caused the tendon thread to get bigger. When it did, it filled the hole created by the needle. This piece is giving you more information about how they made the clothes. One thing I would draw your attention to would be the caribou skin made the excellent clothing. That is what I would add to your clothing. You could also add that it was warm and lightweight. Inuits make boots from seal or caribou skin. Inuit girls learn sewing from their mothers and elders. And elders are people in the family like your grandparents or people that are older than you and wiser. On this page, it's called The Amazing Caribou. 
It's just an extra little excerpt for interesting information about the animal that was so useful to the Inuits. You don't have to use any of this information. However, it's good to have an idea about what they're like. Every summer, caribou gather into gigantic herds and walk hundreds of miles toward feeding grounds. Once there, a caribou may eat 12 pounds or 5 kilograms of grass and other plants per day. A large male can stand 5 feet high, taller if you include the antlers, and weigh 350 to 400 pounds on average. Caribou are famous for their role in Inuit life, but the animal itself is extraordinary. So it gives you a little insight into what the caribou is like. This chapter is called House of Snow. So the heading has to do with the shelter. So make sure as we read, we think about the questions that are in your organizer related to shelter. The Inuit word igloo means house. Inuit used the word for any dwelling or any living. The famous snow house that English speakers call the igloo was only used by Inuit in Greenland and parts of Canada. To make an igloo, the builder used a knife made from bone or a horn to cut blocks of snow from piksik or snowdrift. Cutting blocks left a pit in the snow. The builder then used the blocks to build a dome over the pit. If I think about what would be important from this section of the text, I would think the word igloo means house would be important. I would also think about how they made it partially. They used a knife to cut blocks of snow from a snowdrift. Those parts would be important to understand how they piece together an igloo. And you can see it on the right hand side in the photograph right here. Cutting blocks left a pit in the snow. The builder then used the blocks to build a dome over the pit. That last part might be important. That they created a dome over the pit or the pit which is kind of like the hole in the snow. This is interesting up here. The caption says, a skilled builder could put up an igloo in an hour. Can you imagine being able to put your home together in one hour? The sleeping area in the pit lay below the snow level outside the igloo. The Inuit polished the blocks to make them fit together. A well-made igloo was strong enough to support a person standing on the roof. It was also warm. You're probably thinking like I am. How could a house made of snow be warm? The snow piled outside plus the air trapped in the snow blocks acted as insulation. You have insulation in your house that helps keep the heat inside of your house. That is called insulation. As a result, the inside of an igloo was sometimes heated up to 60 degrees Fahrenheit. And if you think about that, and the temperatures and the cold where it could get in the negatives, that's really high to be able to have a house made of snow that's 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Some parts to highlight from this section would be the sleeping area lay below the snow level. And then I would also recommend the insulation that was comp that was that happened because of the snow pile and the air trapped in the snow blocks and that it could be about 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Be sure to use all of this to add to your section of shelter. Light and heat. An Inuit family could make the igloo warmer by lighting a kudlik, a lamp of carved soapstone filled with seal or whale oil. The lamp provided not only light, but heat. A family used its kudlik to cook, dry clothes, and melt snow for drinking water. The Inuit called snow melted for water aniuk. 
In fact, the Inuit had more than 30 different words for snow. An Inuit woman tends to her kudlik. Seal and whale oil came from the fat of each animal. In this section, there may not be anything specific to relate to your things in your organizer, but if you'd like to go back and add anything to interesting facts, you may pause and go back and do so. In some parts of the Arctic, the Inuit might spend the summer months in tents. Like their Thule ancestors, these Inuits stretched a seal or caribou skins over a frame made of wood or whale bones. In Alaska, the Inuit preferred houses built of stone and frozen sod. Other Inuit built small structures out of driftwood. Twenty people might live in a large house. People hung up skins to create walls. Here it says the Inuit sometimes built homes out of rocks, sod, and whalebone. So you could also use this as part of your shelter section if you wanted to make sure that you mention that sometimes in the summer months they use the tents and the tents were made of the whale bones but I know that this was also mentioned before so this could go in the shelter section but it doesn't have to start it travel by land and sea so in this case I would make sure that you mention it's going to be transportation this is all about your transportation when you travel. Make sure you're on that tab in your foldable. The Inuit used several clever inventions to travel the rough Arctic landscape. On land, the dog sled was the main way of getting around. The Inuit made the sled from wood or animal bones and set it on runners that glided across snow. A dog sled carried goods and an Inuit musher, or driver, who steered. A team of dogs, the ancestors of today's huskies and malamutes, pulled the load. Inuit called a dog sled a kamutik. Huskies can withstand temperatures as cold as negative 75 degrees Fahrenheit. When looking at this section, I would make sure that you mention dog sled was the main way of getting around so that they got around mostly on dog sleds. They made the sled from wood or animal bones and then it glided across the snow. You could also mention that the driver is called the musher and that it was pulled by a team of dogs. This section is called Art and Spirit. In this section, there may not be anything to add. It just gives you a background about the Inuits. Inuit art is famous around the world. Members of both the Dorset and Thule cultures carved animal shapes and masks out of bone, caribou antler, walrus tusk, and stone. The Inuit who shaped the figurines and other items believe their works had the power to keep away evil or allow them to contact spirits. Members of the Thule peoples also made everyday items that range from buttons and earrings to harpoons. Here's a comb in the shape of a woman. Making the journey. So this is how they travel or what they do when they travel. An Inuit musher used landmarks such as rivers and hills to guide him on his journey. The tundra, however, was often a flat plain where everything looked the same. So as they're traveling, they don't have MapQuest or GPS to help them. They have to use landmarks or things around them to help them identify where they are. In that case, the musher built a pile of stones called an unuksuk. This served as a sign pointing a traveler in the right direction. An inuksuk had other uses. It could show a good hunting spot, mark a food store's location, or fence and caribou to be killed. The 2010 Winter Olympics logo was based on an inuksuk. Some inuksuks have a human shape. So if you wanted to identify how they traveled, so their transportation or their travel, you could say that when something looks the same, like an area looked the same, they built an inuksuk that would point them in the right direction.
on the water. If I look up here at the caption, it says kayaks were sometimes 20 feet long. So I know that in the water, they actually built kayaks and they look very similar to the kayaks that we use today. The Inuit invented kayaks. That's really interesting. I may make a note that I'm going to make sure that I use that in my interesting facts or maybe in my transportation section. On the water. Inuit living on the coast used different kinds of boats for different jobs. The one-man kayak was covered in waterproof seal skin and built especially to fit its owner's body. Thanks to its shape, the kayak was almost impossible to tip over. Even when it did, the kayaker could easily roll the boat back into position. The Inuit built a faster type of long kayak to travel great distances. So I'm going to stop and look back at some of this information. What it was telling me is that the kayak is built to fit its owner's body. So each man had a kayak that was especially made to fit him. It was almost impossible to tip over. And it also built a faster one to travel longer distances. So they used different kinds of kayaks for different jobs. If they wanted to hunt, they used one kind. If they needed to travel, they would use a different kind. Let's look at the next page. The Inuit used larger umiak to carry dogs, goods, and larger numbers of people. To build an umiak, the Inuit fitted together pieces of driftwood with pegs and tied cords. Seal skin was then stretched over the frame. A large umiak might be 30 feet long. Inuit sailors could bring the flat bottom boat close to shore. That made the umiak an excellent boat for hauling goods from one hunting ground to the next. So this is giving more information about the types of boats that they would use. This caption said about seven seal skins are needed to cover one large umiak. Inuit society. Society refers to how people live and what they believe. Inuit men and women each had clear roles. The men hunted and fished. Women cooked, sewed, and raised the children, though some women also fished. Because men spent long periods away on hunts, women had to be strong and independent. At the same time, men had to know how to cook and sew for themselves when away from home. Most Inuit got married, families, in fact, sometimes arranged a marriage years before their children became adults. The Inuit did not have wedding ceremonies. One thing you might want to take away from this section is that the women cooked, sewed, and raised the children. Some might have fished. And the men hunted and fished. But I would also mention that the women were independent, which meant they were able to live basically by themselves and do things themselves. Men also had to be independent because they had to do things when they were away from home, like cook and sew. Marriage. Inuit marriages often included more than one wife or husband. If a man was leaving on a journey, for example, he might trade a sick wife to another man for a healthier wife who could manage the home. Survival depended on man-woman teamwork. If children were born from such marriages, they considered it normal to have two mothers and two fathers. A large family at home. An Inuit family often included more people than just a father and mother and children. The Inuit's grandparents might live with the family. In some cases, uncles and aunts and their children lived with them too. But every household had one head. This man was respected for his wisdom and experience. Though Inuit men and women considered themselves equals in many ways, the men made the important decisions. So if you think about that as a society today, in a lot of households, this might be similar or different to the way that your household is. However, it was very common for it just to be more than just the father, mother, and the children to be in that family. Timeline of Inuit history. 
1000 CE, the Inuit ancestors known as Thule moved east from the Alaskan coast. 1200, the Thule meet Vikings. 1576, the Inuit have first contact with Europeans. European, 1800s, European diseases kill 90% of the Inuit in Alaska. Oh, that was not mentioned in this book. That's pretty interesting. 1999, Nunavut, where the population is mostly Inuit, becomes a territory in Canada. So this tells me right here that there are still people who are Inuit living in the United States, or I'm sorry, North America today, possibly in Canada. Changing ways. Today, differences between the Inuit and Europeans still affect Inuit society. So there are differences between the way that Europeans live and the way that Inuit live, and that they still affect how the Inuits live. The Inuit continue to adjust to new ways. Their challenge is to find ways to honor the traditions of their elders while living in today's rapidly changing world. So you can think about all the technology that we have and all the things that we have access to that these people have chosen not to, not to have. In Canada's Nunavut Territory, 83% of the people are Inuit. Girls from Nunavut dressed in traditional clothing.